Hello, I'm Esther Githu Yort. It's Friday, October 8th. This is Africa 54. In Nigeria, a crackdown in Zamfara State as 187 people are freed from kidnappers. COVID-19 vaccine manufacturer Moderna plans to open a plant on the continent as drug companies are urged to help the world's poorest. And a South African urban farm tackles pandemic-linked hunger. Nigerian police say 187 people have been freed from armed gangs of kidnappers amid a security crackdown in Zamfara State. Nekachile has more. Security forces freed nearly 200 people in northwestern Nigeria on Thursday, police said, amid a sweeping crackdown against armed kidnapping gangs. Since the end of last year, Zamfara has been at the center of often violent abductions by gone toting so-called bandits. Last month, the government shut off telecommunication services in the state to help armed forces tackle the gangs. Zamfara police said 187 men, women and children had been taken from four local government areas some weeks ago. Commissioner of Police Ayuba Elkana. Bandits decided to flee because of the pressure on them. That gave us the guts to enter and get them rescued. The gangs have grown bolder over time, attacking army outposts, breaking prisoners out of jail, and in July, shooting down an Air Force jet. Amid the crackdown, authorities in Zamfara's neighboring states have complained the bandits are pouring into their territories and causing havoc. That was Neka Chile of Reuters reporting. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, South Africa is experiencing a threefold increase in hunger, according to a national survey. One man is helping to tackle the problem by launching community farms to help feed inner city residents. Linda Giftash reports from Johannesburg. Between flower beds, along roadsides and on school fields, crops are springing up around South Africa's largest city. The idea of these so-called edible streets was spearheaded by Simbonga Mkanda Mandla and the non-profit Makers Valley Partnership to curb hunger and malnutrition. The need became ever more apparent as gardens were picked bare when lockdowns hit last year. You could see that like, uh, this household like, having had uh, a meal uh, in the past two days or so, and then uh, definitely then like uh, uh, others will open up uh, their fridge, refrigerator for you or others will open up their cupboard. You could see that like, there's literally nothing. South Africa is a major producer and exporter of fresh food, but many in the country aren't able to fill their plates. A national survey led by South Africa's Research Council found that as many as 22% of the country's 60 million people experienced hunger since the pandemic struck. That's compared to just 6% pre-pandemic. It's about inequalities and um, ineffective access to food in the different regions of the country. People not only lost their jobs, they didn't have access to food. About 100 people benefit monthly from the food being produced on this urban farm. An open kitchen is also available to anyone in the community. This urban farmer says growing vegetables at home and in communities is one solution to secure nutritious food. We've seen a lot of people coming here, you know, uh, wanting to, to harvest some, they don't have money. So we've seen a lot of people coming through and with the willingness of also working in the land because they see the results that they're going to eat at the end of the day. They're also teaching children how to grow vegetables and herbs, skills they can take home. With food prices having spiked nearly 7% this year, according to the government, these projects have become crucial to many. If more people can be involved, you know, in growing food, you know, taking care of vacant land and try to make it in a food forest, then we can have more food, more people that we can feed. Waiting for seeds to sprout is no quick fix. But with more funding, Makers Valley wants to plant more vegetable patches throughout the community to help put more greens on people's plates. Linda Giftash for VOA News, Johannesburg. 
At a summit aiming to turn the page with Africa, French President Emmanuel Macron faced angry and frustrated young Africans Friday over a range of issues, including migration and the vestiges of colonialism. Billed as a chance to prove France's commitment in particular to young Africans, the Africa-France summit gathered 3,000 business leaders, artists and athletes in the southern French city of Montpellier. One woman exclaimed to President Macron, quote, I can no longer stand to see African youths dying in the sea trying to reach Europe. A young Guinean urged Macron to support the transition after the military coup that deposed longtime President Alpha Conde last month. The French president is also debating with 12 young people chosen by the Cameroon intellectual Akila Bembe who was tasked with organizing the meeting. Internet giant Google is planning to invest $1 billion in Africa over the next five years to ensure access to fast and cheaper internet. The company also says it will back startups to, start to support the continent's digital transformation. Shara Lee reports. Google is to invest big in Africa. It's pledged a billion dollars over the next five years and wants to ensure access to faster and cheaper internet, as well as backing startups fueling the continent's digital transformation. The unit of US tech company Alphabet made the announcement at a virtual event this week where it launched an Africa investment fund. It plans to invest $50 million in startups, providing them with access to Google employees, network and technologies. Google Africa director Nitin Gaudria. We are specifically looking at fintech, logistics, e-commerce, uh, local language content. But again, we're not limiting ourselves to these verticals. We're really looking at this across a number of verticals. We're looking at areas that might have some strategic overlap with, uh, with uh, Google and where Google could potentially add value um, in partnering with some of these startups. Small businesses in Africa often struggle to get capital because they lack the collateral required by banks in case they default. In collaboration with not-for-profit organization Kiva, Google will also provide $10 million in low-interest loans to help smaller outfits and entrepreneurs with a focus on those in Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria and South Africa. Google said a program pioneered last year in Kenya with Safaricom would be expanded across the continent. It allows customers to pay for 4G-enabled phones in installments. Gadria added that an undersea cable being built by Google to link Africa and Europe should come into service in the second half of next year, increasing internet speed and lowering data costs. Burkina Faso is making headlines for an Islamist insurgency that has created one of the world's fastest growing humanitarian crises. But one man is showcasing what the country has to offer beyond conflict with a group he created called Burkina Faso is Sheikh. Henry Wilkins reports from Ouagadougou. Since its conflicts began nearly six years ago, tourists in Burkina Faso have become a rare sight. The U.S. State Department advises against all travel to the country due to the risk of terrorism, kidnapping and crime. Ben Nombre, a local web developer, is doing what he can to turn the tide of the country's image and showcase the good the country has to offer. Burkina Faso is chic is an idea I came up with in 2019 when I started to notice that we had a lot of terrorist attacks. I saw that Burkina Faso was losing its image. You know that Burkina Faso has long been a country where there were a lot of tourists coming in, but in recent years, we lost many of them. Burkina Faso A Sheik's Facebook page has attracted almost 24,000 followers. It posts regularly highlighting a range of topics from lively night spots to the country's nature and wildlife. The West African country has a rich equestrian heritage, but this local business that had catered to tourists wishing to ride horses is struggling, says the owner. It has been affected a lot. It has been affected a lot since 2016. It is like you see at one time in such a moments here, it was full of people, but since the terrorism, it's affected a lot. The government says that as international tourist numbers have dropped, they are looking at aiding businesses in the tourism industry. We had a lot of money coming in from tourism, but we saw a considerable drop of more than 28% of that income. So there was a negative impact, at least in the beginning. 
Now it is necessary to develop domestic tourism instead of foreign tourism. The manager of Squash Time, a recently opened club which offers visitors the chance to play squash before drinks and dancing, says that when Nombre made a post about them on Burkina Faso A Chic, it transformed their business. Pour vous dire vrai, ça boosté énormément notre business. To tell you the truth, it boosted our business enormously. To such a point, it's no exaggeration to say there were weekends where we had to turn people away. We are in the process of extending the building so that we can take them. Because, frankly, we're overwhelmed. I really take my hat off to Mr. Ben. Mon chapeau à ce, à Monsieur Ben. Even in the midst of conflict, some aspects of Burkina Faso still thrive. Henry Wilkins for VOA News, Ouagadougou, Burkina Faso. Mudana is planning to invest about $500 million to build a factory in Africa designed to make up to 500 million doses of mRNA vaccines each year, including its COVID-19 shot. Meanwhile, pressure continues to grow on the pharmaceutical industry to manufacture drugs on the continent. Clara Frank has the details. Facing pressure to supply COVID-19 vaccines to the developing world, Moderna says it'll build a plant in Africa. The company said Thursday it plans to invest about half a billion dollars to produce up to 500 million doses of mRNA vaccines each year, including its COVID-19 shot. It hasn't decided upon a country or location yet, but will decide soon. It said the site will also include bottling and packaging capabilities. Moderna will become the first company to build its own plant on the continent. It has supplied more than 500 million doses of its COVID-19 vaccine so far. In July, rival Pfizer and its partner BioNTech struck a deal with a South African company to make and deliver around 100 million vaccine doses a year. While the companies are ramping up to supply vaccines, they're less willing to share their technology. Many Western drug makers received government support to develop vaccines, but they strongly oppose calls to transfer intellectual property to make them. They argue they need to oversee any tech transfer due to the complexity of the manufacturing process. Shares of Moderna, which have fallen by a fifth in just the past five days, rose in early trading Thursday. Clara Frank, VOA News. The White House is taking new steps to prevent the deportation of hundreds of thousands of so-called dreamers or immigrants who came to the U.S. as children. Keda Kostresi spoke to a DACA recipient about life as a dreamer. 21-year-old Diana Lila was born in Greece to Albanian parents. Yet the only home she has known is the United States. My parents, for a better life for me, for a better life for them, they decided to go to the United States. So in the year 2001, when I was 18 months old, I immigrated to the United States um, and I was an undocumented immigrant. Lilo says her parents are still undocumented. She is one of an estimated 700,000 undocumented young people brought to the U.S. as children. Lila recalls her childhood in Waterbury, Connecticut. I definitely was really overwhelmed growing up. I had a lot of anxiety because how could I not? You know, I was a child growing up with the fact that some people didn't want me here. Some people didn't think I belonged here. But this is the only home I've ever known. So I've always felt like I belonged here. What makes things even more difficult for Lilo is that she also does not have Albanian or Greek citizenship making her one of about 200,000 stateless people living in the United States. I've never been able to travel to leave the United States. Being stateless, I don't have a passport. So say I was granted a green card tomorrow, I still wouldn't be able to leave. In 2012, President Barack Obama issued an executive order to protect young people like Lilo through the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, or DACA. Lilo says the program helped her lead a more normal life and live without the fear she had before. But in the summer of 2021, a Texas judge ruled that DACA was illegal. 
In response, the Biden administration rewrote the executive order to satisfy the Texas court and keep the Obama order protections for DREAMers in place. I just never feel secure. Houston immigration attorney Olsa Ali Caicano says the main problem is that DACA doesn't offer a permanent solution. It's just temporary, so it could be renewed for as long as the administration says it is okay and as long as the courts um, affirm it and they're fine with it. Um, however, it could be taken away at any time. Lilo is pushing forward with her dreams. She's now a senior studying government and data science at Harvard University, and she hopes to attend law school and become an immigration lawyer. Keita Costrezzi, VOA News, New York. Journalists Maria Ressa of the Philippines and Dmitry Muratov of Russia won the 2021 Nobel Peace Prize on Friday for their fight for freedom of expression in countries where media outlets have faced persistent attacks and reporters have been murdered. In announcing the award, Berit Rees Anderson, chair of the Norwegian Nobel Committee, stressed that an independent press is vital in promoting peace. The Nobel Committee was later put on the spot by a reporter who asked about its, its decision to award the 2019 Peace Prize to Ethiopian Prime Minister Abe Ahmed, who has since become embroiled in a domestic conflict with its Tigray region. And Reese Anderson replied, quote, Today, I will not comment on other Nobel laureates. Tell us what you think about Africa 54. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Still to come, a look at summer's music hits plus a surprise guest you may recognize. Stay with us. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Lino Khmudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living, right here on VOA. German officials unveiled this week what they say is the world's first commercial plant for making synthetic kerosene. It's seen as a climate-friendly way to produce jet fuel and could potentially be game-changing. Aviation currently accounts for about 2.5 percent of worldwide emissions of carbon dioxide, a not-so-friendly greenhouse gas that contributes to global warming. We get more from VOA's Maria Madialo. Using water and electricity from wind farms to produce hydrogen, a German facility then combines it with carbon dioxide. Dietrich Brockhagen, chief executive of the nonprofit group behind the project, explains the process. So you have the two feedstock coming in here. One is carbon dioxide, and on the other hand, you have hydrogen. And those two are then here mixed together to synthesis gas, and out of this is then synthetically formed ecorazine in this plant. The amount of fuel this plant can produce beginning early next year is small, just eight barrels a day or about 335 gallons of jet fuel, enough to fill up one small passenger plane every three weeks. But the company and its partners say the goal is to show the process is technologically doable and could be scaled up if demand goes up. Our mission of Ineratech is that we will build our plants all over the world. Wherever you have access to cheap electricity, where you can harvest solar, where you can harvest wind. This can be in South Africa, this can be in South America, this can be in the MENA region, this can be in Australia. Wherever you can build up renewable energy capacities and store the renewable energy then in these liquid fuels and utilize it in existing infrastructures. In 2019, fuel consumption of commercial airlines worldwide reached 95 billion gallons, according to the International Air Transport Association. Germany's Environment Minister Sven Scholz attended the ceremony for the new plant. And this project is very, very important because it shows that climate neutrality in 2045 is possible also in aviation. 
We have all the knowledge, we have all the technology we need to make uh, flying uh, sustainable uh, with uh, e-fuels, with e-kerosene. What about cost? Climate analyst Falco Ukerd, who's not involved with the project, weighs in. Through cheap solar mainly, um, it, it can be possible in the future to produce uh, e-fuels that are as cheap as fossil fuels today. The company has not yet said how much it plans to charge its first customer, German airline Lufthansa. Maria Magiallo, VOA News. Inspired by his love of Jet Li movies, Uganda skizer Sejemba started training in Kung Fu. Today, he has trained with Chinese experts, stars in action films, and is training a new generation. Here's David Doyle. Kiza Sejemba fell in love with Kung Fu while watching Jet Li movies as a teenager. Today, the 30-year-old Ugandan stars in action movies himself. And he's passing on the martial art to a new generation. Yes. Growing up in an informal settlement in Kampala, he says he had to learn at an early age how to ward off muggers. I decided, no, these girls, they need to get what they call self-defense so that they can at least fight for themselves. Sajemba has been starring in films made by Wakaliwood, a Ugandan low-budget action film company, for over a decade. How did you learn Kung Fu? But in 2017, while shooting Bruce Yu, he traveled to China to train with Kung Fu experts. That was where his passion for teaching was fostered. He says an abbot taught him some techniques and told him to spread Kung Fu in Africa. So that's what Sajemba did. He opened a club in his backyard, training young people aged between 5 and 16. Many at the club in the central town of Nansana are girls, encouraged by their communities to gain self-defense skills. And one student is his five-year-old daughter, Asfa Nakalija. She says she plans to use the techniques she's learned to defend herself and fight off wrong people. Sajemba's classes are free of charge, but he says attendance has dropped off amid the global health crisis. Nevertheless, he has high hopes for his students. What I need from Kung Fu in Uganda, I need at least to get. Even if one person can go and uh, compete uh, in Olympics, World Olympics, I think it will be very, very better for me. And I will never, I will never give up until Kung Fu reaches on top. Kung Fu is not currently an Olympic sport, but promoters are fighting for its inclusion. And it is an event at the Youth Olympic Games. David Doyle of Reuters filed that report. This week's entertainment report takes a look at this summer's music hits with Heather Maxwell's top three. She also has a surprise guest that you may recognize. Hey guys, are you ready for my top three? All right, but first, I have a surprise for you. Hey guys! <laughs> <laughs> this is Kwame Ofori joining me for this top three. Mm -hmm. So, you ready? Oh yeah, I'm ready. Let's get started. Let's go, Flacco. Number three is Black Sheriff from Ghana with Second Sermon. I love this song, Kwame. I mean, I love the darkness mm -hmm. of the video and the way he raps. It's like, it's so infectious. Half the time, I don't know what he's saying, but I love the way he raps. I just keep listening to it over <laughs> and over. I 
And yes, I mean, Black Sheriff is from that Asaka trap drill, you know, fraternity in Ghana, Kumase. And so that's why you're hearing that beat. And he is good. He got introduced to us first sermon, and this is second sermon. Yes, yeah. And yeah. he's got a lot of views on YouTube. Oh, I mean, yeah. he's got a following. Oh, yeah. Then our boy is listening to him, yes. by the way. <laughs> <laughs> So for number two, we have Omale from Nigeria. And number one is by Casper Nyovest from South Africa <laughs> with Siatanda. Now, mm -hmm. this also features producer uh, Abidoza yeah. and singer Buchle. Mm -hmm. And it's awesome. favorite part about this song is not only the beat and the dancing it's that <laughs> spirit of love like love you're not supposed to have this mm -hmm. sort of secret mm -hmm. like oh my gosh <laughs> and it works and and she is just so adorable she uh, is she is, is adorable. Yeah, she is oh i love how they break out mm -hmm. break out and start dancing they get together in the end i just love it because it's an, I'm a piano song well, that's it <laughs> that too. Do you have any I'm a piano moves for me? Can you do it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know the I know the 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 size thing that they do. Yeah, that's it. I mean, I try. Yes. <laughs> That is our Summer Hits Top 3. I'm Heather. And I'm Kwame. See y'all next time. Good to see you too, Heather and Kwame. You make our Friday. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, have a great weekend.